This is the introductory lecture of an online graduate course on Lie groups. And to get one thing out of the way, it's pronounced Lie groups, not Lie groups, because it's named after the Norwegian mathematician Sophus Lie, and they spell things a bit differently over there. So what is a Lie group? Well, a Lie group, as the name suggests, is a group, and it's also a manifold. So saying it's a manifold means it looks locally like um, n-dimensional space over the reals for some integer n, where this number n is called the dimension of the Lie group. So a typical example might be the group GLn over the reals. So um, you recall from linear algebra that GLn means n by n matrices with determinant non-zero, and if a matrix has non-zero determinant, it has, has an inverse, and the product of two matrices with non-zero determinant has non-zero determinant, so this certainly forms a group. And it's also a manifold because it's an open subset of n by n matrices over the reals, and this is isomorphic to r to the n squared. So GLn of r looks locally like r to the n squared, and you can check that the group operation is continuous and smooth and so on. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do in this introductory lecture is go through um, some of the um, uh, simpler examples of Lie groups. So let's start with dimension zero. Well, Lie groups of dimension zero are essentially the same as discrete groups. This means either groups where you've put the discrete topology on them or groups where you just completely ignore the topology completely. Um, and we would like to classify Lie groups in order to understand them. And we're already completely stuck in the zero dimensional case because the classification of discrete groups is completely hopeless. Even for finite discrete groups, we, we, we can't really classify them in any meaningful way. I mean, we can classify the simple ones, but how the simple ones are joined together seems to be very complicated. Um, however, um, we can sort of reduce any Lie group to a discrete group and a connected group. So if we take a Lie group G, then it's got um, a connected component containing the identity and this is also a Lie group, and it's a normal subgroup, so we can form the quotient group G modulo G0, and um, um, this group here is now discrete or zero-dimensional. So in some sense, we can split any Lie group into a discrete part and a connected part, and it turns out that we can more or less classify the connected Lie groups uh, or, or to some fudging about nilpotent groups that I'll mention later. So a typical example of this, let's take G to be the, the group of non-zero reals. Then it has a connected component consisting of the positive reals under multiplication. And if you take the quotient of the non-zero reals by positive reals, you get a little group with two elements because a real can either be positive or negative. So this is sort of what a, how a general Lie group decomposes. It's got a connected normal subgroup and the quotient is discrete. Um, so um, the theory of Lie groups really concentrates largely on connected Lie groups. In fact, some authors even say a, add the condition of being connected into the definition, but that's sometimes a bit inconvenient. It's often useful to allow non-connected Lie groups. Um, so now let's move on to the dimension one case. And here there are several obvious examples. First of all, we've got the real numbers under addition. obviously a one-dimensional Lie group. Secondly, we've got the non-zero real numbers under multiplication. 
And there's another example we can have. We can have the circle group S1, which is contained in the non-zero complex number. So this is the, the this is the complex numbers Z of absolute value equal to one. So it's called the circle group because it looks very much like a circle. Um, and these are all very closely related. For example, there's a homomorphism of groups from R to the non-zero reals given by the exponential map. And there's a homomorphism of groups from the reals to the circle group given by, I think, x to um, e to the 2 pi i x. So I've just put the 2 pi in there out of habit. And these are homomorphisms of groups. And this map here makes the reals, identifies the reals with the connected component of, of the non-zero reals. So um, the, the, the connected components of these two groups are the same. Here the reals obviously aren't isomorphic to the connected component of S1, which is just S1. However, this is an example of something called a local isomorphism. So what this means is that, the, is that if you take the reals under addition and you take the circle group under multiplication, you can take a little neighbourhood of the identity in both of them, for instance there and there, and the, this map is, is an isomorphism from this little chunk to this little chunk in that it preserves multiplication wherever you are defined. So if you sort of live at the identity element of the group and you're kind of short-sighted so you can't see very far, you would think these two groups are really the same. Um, and um, um, in fact any connected one-dimensional Lie group is isomorphic to either the reals under addition or to the circle group S1. Um, another way of saying this is that um, any one-dimensional Lie group is got by taking the one-dimensional vector space and quotienting it out by some discrete subgroup. So the discrete subgroup is zero in this case and it's z in this case. Um, now let's have a look at some two-dimensional examples. So one obvious way of getting two-dimensional examples is to take the product of two one-dimensional examples. So we get R1 times R1, which is just a two-dimensional vector space, and we get R1 times S1, and we get S1 times S1, which is um, the famous torus group. So looks something like a torus and this looks something like an infinitely long cylinder and this of course just looks like a plane. And all of these are still abelian as were all the one-dimensional groups and in fact you can see that these are all of the form a two-dimensional vector space quotient out by a discrete group. The discrete group can be zero or z or z squared in these three cases. Um, and in fact, more generally, any abelian Lie group, any abelian connected Lie group, um, can be written like this. It's of the form, um, it's isomorphic to r to the m times s1 to the n, which is isomorphic to r to the m plus n modulo some discrete subgroup. So we know what all the connected abelian Lie groups are. As usual, disconnected ones classifying even abelian groups is hopelessly complicated in general. Although, of course, you can do the finite ones. So these are abelian groups. And you can ask, are there any other any non-abelian Lie groups? Well, in dimension one, there aren't. But in dimension two, we come across the first non-abelian connected example. And this is the AX plus B group. So um, the, the, the name suggests, this is the group of all linear transformations from R to R, um, well, which, which take X 
to AX plus B. So it's the group of affine transformations of the reals. And you can represent this group as matrices because if you've got a little two by two matrices the form AB01 and multiply it by X1, then you maybe get AX plus B1. So, so the, 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 this group can be thought of as, as a group of all these matrices here, where of course we take A not equal to zero. And it's got a connected component, which are the matrices with A positive. Um, and this group is not abelian, as you can very easily check, but it is an example of a solvable Lie group. Um, and the meaning of solvable for Lie groups is much the same as the definition of solvable for um, discrete groups. What it means is we've got um, a series of subgroups, G0 contained, G1 contained, and G2, and so on, up to Gn, which is equal to G, such that each quotient G n over sorry G i over G i minus one is abelian. Of course, we implicitly assume that each G i is contained in in the is a normal subgroup of the, of the next group. So, in the case of two by two matrices, what are G zero and G one and G two and so on? Well, we can draw a picture of them like this. So we have A B zero one. G zero is just the identity. G one is just um, the, the group of all um, possible elements B with A being equal to 1 and you can think of G2 as being the whole group. So um, in, in this particular case this, this, this chain just as length 1. Um, now let's move on to groups of dimension 3. And here we come across what is possibly the, the single most useful Lie group of them all, which is the group SL2R. So this is the special linear group. And it consists of all matrices A, B, C, D, with A, D minus B, C is equal to 1. So this is, of course, just the determinant. Um, and since the determinant is multiplicative, um, these matrices here form a group and um, two by two matrices are four dimensional. We've cut the dimension down one by putting it on this equation. So, so this is dimension three. Um, and um, there's another closely related group, which is the group PSL2 of R. And this is the group SL2 of R modulo the group um, plus or minus one by which we mean and the matrices plus one, plus one, and minus one, minus one. So you can see this forms a little normal subgroup of order two, so we get a quotient here. P stands for projective, because it acts on projective space if you care about that sort of thing. Um, so um, as a typical example of an application of this group, this group is the group of automorphisms of the upper half plane in complex analysis. So um, if the upper half plane H uh, has its elements denoted by tau, then the action is given by A, B, C, D acting on tau is equal to A tau plus B over C tau plus D. And you notice that if um, that the, the, the matrix minus one acts trivially. So, so although SL2 acts on the upper half plane to get the group of automorphisms, we should really quotient out by it and get the group PSL2 of R. Um, and uh, another three-dimensional group is the sphere S3. Um, and this can be written as the group of unit quaternions. So you remember the quaternions consist of um, Hamilton's quaternions are the numbers of the form A plus B I plus C J plus D K with the multiplication given by I J equals K equals minus J I J K equals I equals minus K J and K I equals J equals minus I K. 
and Hamilton showed that this um, formed a non-commutative division ring. And um, it has a sub, the subgroup S3 consists of all quater quaternions with a squared plus b squared plus c squared plus d squared equals 1. And it's not very difficult to check that this is closed under multiplication. Um, incidentally, that you can think of if, if this quaternion is called z, then this number here is equal to z times z bar, where z bar is the quaternion a minus b i minus c j minus d k. So it's kind of a sort of analogue of complex conjugation for the complex numbers. Um, by the way, we had S1 being a Lie group and we had S3 being a Lie group. And you may think I forgot to include S2 as a Lie group. Um, in fact, S2 is not a Lie group. Um, it has no... Um, it has no group structure on it at all, at least not one that, that, that is um, continuous. Um, in fact, S0, S1 and S3 are the only spheres that are Lie groups. And you can think of these as being the numbers of absolute value 1 inside the reals, or the complex numbers, or the quaternions. So this corresponds, this is very close related to the fact that there are only three finite dimensional division algebras over the reals. They, they, they correspond to the spheres that are Lie groups. Um, um, there's a, another um, um, three-dimensional group, which is the Heisenberg group. named after the guy who invented quantum mechanics. And the Heisenberg group, well, it either consists of the matrices of this form or it consists of the matrices of this form quotient out by the normal subgroup of all matrices of this form where n is in the integers. And I never quite worked out whether the Heisenberg group is this or, or this. I think it depends on which author you read. Um, so this is an example of taking a a Lie group and quotienting out by a discrete subgroup of the center. Um, and um, this group turns up in quantum mechanics quite a lot. Um, so suppose you look at all the transformations of functions on the reals. So you can transform a function by shifting it by a constant, or you can transform a function by multiplying it by a constant, sorry, um, by multiplying it by a periodic function, or you can multiply it by a constant of absolute value 1. And if you take the group generated by these transformations, it's three-dimensional and is essentially the same as this bit of the Heisenberg group. You, you see we have to quotient out by the discrete subgroup because if you think of these constants as e to the i b, then, um, then whenever, well, let's put 2 pi i b, then whenever b is a, an integer, this becomes 1. Um, so... Um, this is a common way of constructing Lie groups from other Lie groups who can quotient out by a discrete subgroup of the center. Um, now, you notice this group here is isomorphic to R3, so it's, it's um, simply connected. And if we're quotienting out by a discrete subgroup of the center, it turns out this quotient here is not simply connected, but it is fundamental group given by the integers, which is the thing you quotient out by. OK, I haven't quite discussed fundamental groups yet, but this is a, just a quick introductory survey. Um, conversely, you can sort of reverse this process. If you've got a group like this one with a non-trivial fundamental group, you can take a sort of covering space out of it and get back, the, 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 uh, get back a simply connected group. Um, so um, the idea of this is that you can reduce the classification of all Lie groups to the classification of simply connected Lie groups because it turns out that any Lie group is the quotient of a simply connected Lie group by, by um, 
a discrete subgroup of, of, of the center. Um, the Heisenberg group is also an example of a nilpotent group. So let's just recall what a nilpotent group is. So if you've got a group G, let's call it G0, we can kill off the center. So let's put G1 equals G0 modulo the center. Well, um, you might think G1 doesn't have a center, but it, but, but it actually can have a center because, I mean, it wouldn't have been a center in G0, but it might now become a center in G, G1. And so you can now repeat this process. You put G2 equals G1, and then you kill off the center. And you sort of continue like this. And if Gn is the identity group, G0 is called nilpotent. The reason for the name nilpotent will, will appear later when we talk about Lie algebras. Um, so uh, the Heisenberg group is nilpotent because if you look at it, the center is consists of um, essentially these matrices, but by which I mean A and C are zero, and you still keep the ones here, but B is allowed to be anything. So, so, so this is this is the center, and then um, when we kill off that, we get an abelian group. So, so. Um, we, we, we then end up with the, with the whole group there. Um, upper triangular groups have a very strong tendency to be nilpotent. So if I take a group consisting of all matrices like this, then the center consists of just the matrices like this, I, meaning I keep ones down the diagonal and set everything else equal to zero. And if you kill off this, the center of what's left is given by this subgroup. And if you kill off that, the center of what's left is given by this subgroup and the remaining center is, and the, the, what's left is now abelian, so, so it's equal to its whole center. So we get a sort of chain of um, centers of quotients increasing like that. So um, all um, upper triangular groups with ones down the diagonal are nilpotent. Um, conversely, Lee showed that any connected, simply connected Lee group is a closed subgroup of a group like this. So simply connected nilpotent implies that it's a closed subgroup of something like this. Well, I mean, possibly a bigger matrix, of course. So you may think, well, this almost classifies nilpotent groups. Well, it turns out that it doesn't really because um, that there are immensely large numbers of different non-isomorphic closed subgroups of the group of upper triangular matrices. Um, if you try and classify nilpotent groups, you can do so in small dimensions, but the problem very rapidly just becomes completely out of control. Um, um, so now let's have a look at, um, say, dimension six. So here we get the Lorentz group. So the Lorentz group consists of all the rotations of space-time. So, um, I mean, we, we could do the, the, the group of rotations O4 of R, which, as you know, is the, is the group of all rotation, all linear transformations of R preserving the um, quadratic form x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x3 squared plus x4 squared. Um, when you do special relativity, you use a group O1 comma 3R, which means you use the quadratic form x0 squared minus x1 squared minus x2 squared minus x3 squared. Um, there's a, um, some people like putting the minus sign there instead of in front of all these. In fact, there seem to be two, the physicists seem to be divided into two roughly equal subsets who are not on speaking terms with each other, who have different ideas about where you should put the minus signs in this. But anyway, um, so um, uh, this is um, uh, th this group has several components. In fact, this group has four components. Um, the reason is that. Um, in, in, in this group, you can reverse time 
or you can reverse space, in other words, reflect space in a mirror. And you can, of course, also reverse time and space. And physicists get really excited about that because they want to know whether their theories are, are um, um, invariant under time reversal or under space reversal. And at one time it was thought to be obvious that all physical theories were, were invariant under time reversal and space reversal. But much to everyone's surprise, the weak interaction in, in qu quantum field theory turns out to be non-invariant under space inversion. And later it was discovered that um, things aren't even invariant under time reversal or, or even under the combination of these two. Um, so the four components of the Lorentz group turn up quite a lot in physics. Um, if you take the connected component, um, um, this turns out to um, um, have a double cover called a spin group. So this maps onto the connected component of um, O1, 3R. And is an example of the construction I was talking about, that this, this group here has a, a, a non-trivial fundamental group, so we can take covers of it. And one of these is, 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 the, is, is the spin group, and we're going to be constructing spin groups out of Clifford algebras later on. The spin group turns out to be locally isomorphic to the two by two matrices over the complex numbers. Um, in particular, this has, this has two dimensional representations, meaning actions on two dimensional vector spaces, which this group doesn't have. And this is the cause of things like fermions and electrons. Um, by the way, the, the, this isomorphism between these groups is a typical example of an accidental isomorphism. And one of the confusing things about Lie groups is, is, that, is that Lie groups of small dimension have large numbers of accidental isomorphism with, with each other. You know, various sorts of groups which don't look as if they're the same turn out to be locally isomorphic to each other. Um, so um, let's have a look in dimension eight. Um, one very famous example is the group SU3. So U3 means three by three unitary matrices. And S, as usual, means determinant one. So the three by three unitary matrices have dimension nine, and this group therefore is dimension eight. And this appears an awful lot in particle physics. First of all, it's the group that controls, it's the gauge group of quantum chromodynamics. It's also a group involved in the flavor symmetries of um, old style um, theories of the strong interaction. So it's sometimes known as the eightfold way, uh, named by Gelman, I believe. Um, so this is a fairly typical example of a simple Lie group, which means almost the same as simple in group theory. It's got no normal subgroups, except in the theory of Lie groups, you kind of allow discrete subgroups of the center. So this actually has a center of order three, but you ignore that when you when you talk about the group being when groups being simple. Um, dimension 10, one well-known example is the Poincaré group. Um, and this is related to the Lorentz group. So the Lorentz group is the set of all rotations of space-time. The Poincaré group is the set of all um, translations and rotations of space-time. So what we get is a semi-direct product of the group of all translations of space-time, which is a normal subgroup, and on top of that you have sitting the group of all rotations of space-time fixing a point. So what we have here is this is more or less a product of simple groups. In fact, it is actually a simple group, and what we have here is a solvable group. Well, it's actually an abelian group, not just a solvable group. But what this is supposed to illustrate is 
Almost any Lie group is more or less a semi-direct product of a solvable group by a product of simple groups. And about the simplest non-trivial example of this um, that, that occurs in practice may be the Poincaré group, which, which splits as a semi-direct product of translations and a product of simple groups. And this almost gives us a classification of Lie groups because Lie showed that any solvable group is a subgroup of upper triangular matrices for some n, the closed subgroup of this group here. And in the group of upper triangular matrices, you see it's got a subgroup um, that's a nilpotent group, where I mean you, if you put ones on the diagonal, and the quotient is abelian. So solvable groups aren't too far from nilpotent groups. They're, they're just a nilpotent group with an abelian group sitting on top of that. Um, if you do finite group theory, solvable groups are vastly more complicated than that. Um, this, is, this, this, this is only for connected Lie groups. Um, so this sort of reduces the classification of all Lie groups to nilpotent groups and to simple groups. So I'll, I'll finish off by just saying a little bit about simple groups. It turns out we can classify all the simple Lie groups, at least the ones that are um, um, connected and not zero dimensional and so on. So um, it's actually a little bit easier to do the ones that are defined over the complex numbers. So complex Lie groups are defined very much like real Lie groups except that they have to be complex manifolds not real manifolds. Um, and there are some obvious ones. First of all there's SLN of C for n greater than or equal to 1 and there are the orthogonal groups ON of C for n greater than or equal to 3 and there's the symplectic group um, OSP 2 N of C for N greater than or equal to 1. Um, these are the so-called classical groups, um, at least over the complex numbers. Over the reals the classical groups are rather more numerous. Um, and in addition we find Killing found five more. He found five more which are called G2 F4 E6, E7 and E8 by someone who wasn't very imaginative about naming things. So the dimensions of these groups are 14, 52, 78, 133 and 248. And Killing really ought to be a lot better known. Um, he was a kind of really modest shy guy and invented a lot of things that were later named after other people. So later on in this course we'll be talking about the Weyl group and the Coxton number and the, Cartan, and the Cartan form and things like that. And these were all actually first invented by Killing and then people kind of forgot he invented them. And he discovered these five exceptional Lie groups and a lot of the credit is given to Cartan who, who came along a lot later than Killing and just filled in a few holes in Killing's work. Um, anyway, so Killing more or less showed that the complex simple Lie groups were given by this list here. Um, so what we'll be doing later on in the course is showing how to construct all these exceptional Lie groups. Um, I'll just finish by drawing pictures of them. Um, there's a famous way of drawing pictures of all these Lie groups. So we draw a picture of SL2 by drawing a point. So each point means SL2. And then all of these other groups found by Killing are obtained by sticking together copies of the group SL2 of the complex numbers. This is one of the reasons I said SL2 was so important. All other groups are kind of built out of copies of it in some sense. So um, the groups SLN have a so-called Dinkin diagram that looks like that. Um, and what this means is each dot is a copy of SL2 and if the dots are not joined it means the copies of SL2 commute with each other and if the dots are joined by line it means the copies of SL2 sit inside each other in the same way that copies of two, two copies of SL2 sit inside SL3. Um, so um, 
This is a sort of picture of the group SLN. The orthogonal groups ON look like this, except for some of them, which look a bit different and look like this. I'll sort of explain this later. And the symplectic groups look like this. And FG2 looks like this. F4 looks like this. And E6, E7, E8 look like this. This and this. So one of the major goals of this course will be to explain what all these Dink and diagram mean, diagrams mean and show how to construct the simple Lie groups by starting with these Dink and diagrams. OK, so um, one of the problems with Lie groups is they're rather complicated as topological manifolds. I mean, they have a very complicated topology and you can simplify them greatly by instead looking at the tangent space. And this is what we will be discussing next lecture, where we find the tangent space of a Lie group at the origin is something called a Lie algebra.